Okay, a couple of days ago you heard the mention of using patterns in one taxon to make decisions about other taxa. And Lee just said, it's not a very good idea. So basically that's the whole point of this talk, okay? Which is to say, thanks to Lee's comment, I really don't have to say anything to you. You can take it as a given that it's not a very good idea. Of course, the end of that sentence is, but, it's what we do all the time and it's what we have to do. So let's just go through a little bit of thinking about this, just so we, we talk about this idea of using indicators or umbrellas. Let's just, let's just kind of go through this a little informally and, and think about it together. So what's the best known taxon on Earth in terms of global knowledge of a taxonomic group, in terms of taxonomy, systematics, distribution, ecology, behavior? Thank you. Birds. Not mammals. Um, you can like it or you can not like it, but <laughs> birds are the best known taxa. You can watch them. How many, how many small rodents did you guys identify to species as we were driving out to St. Kelly today? <laughs> right? How many birds did we identify? So for the last few years I've been working on an attempt to give a state of knowledge of birds in terms of distributions of species and composition of local communities. Um, we started on this in 2010 and worked out a lot of the methods and then tried, not full time, but tried pretty hard for several years to be able to assemble snapshots of the data to be able to see the completeness and the change in the completeness of the data from about 2007, 2008 to present. So this is a data set for end of 2014. It's based on 237 million records of birds. Where you see blue, there's essentially nothing as approaching a complete inventory for the uh, half degree pixel that is, that is, that you can see there. Um, where you see kind of lightest colors, there's some information, and it grades all the way to these darkest oranges. And the dark orange means a very complete inventory. Okay, I'm not gonna go into any of um, those methodologies, because we've actually dealt with them in two previous courses. So what I want you to see, let's just focus on terrestrial areas. We're going to ignore seabirds for a little bit, Kate. The breeding colonies are there. Okay, the breeding colonies are there. Yeah, there you go. Um, but looking at terrestrial areas, what do you see? North America, Western Europe, Australia, South Africa. Okay? And what do you see in this, whoops, sorry in this big diagonal? Nothing, right? So right away we see that we've got some trouble as far as assembling primary data. The biggest problem is in Asia, okay? And that's because of the not yet participation, but hopefully soon participation of major institutions in China and Russia in this enterprise that we can call digital accessible knowledge. You can see fairly spotty for birds in South America other than the Andes, um, and that's reflecting a relatively low participation of the zoological community especially in Brazil. The botanical community, wonderful in Brazil. And then we see Africa, okay? And actually this whole three-year program has been about how do we, we as a global community, promote biodiversity informatics activity in Africa. It's a big, multi-dimensional 
multifaceted challenge. I'm not going to go into it, okay? But what it really comes down to is a combination of at least three major factors. One is relatively few major biodiversity uh, institutions, for example, natural history museums in Africa. Okay, we see South Africa doing great. We know about national museums of Kenya. There are a few more points of light in the world of herbaria. But really, in Africa, there aren't large numbers of major zoological data holders. Okay, that's one factor. Second factor is, where are the specimens and the historical records of African birds? Anybody want to guess? For example, here's the DRC and Rwanda, Rwanda and Burundi. Where are those specimens? Yes, well actually for the DRC, Rwanda and Burundi, you can tell me one museum. Come on, Tervuren in, in, in Belgium, okay? It's the Royal Central African Museum. Um, for Kenya, where, apart from the national museums, where are the main, your major holdings? Society. Yeah, actually the Natural History Museum, yes. but yes. Yeah, so essentially what we're seeing is back and forth between colonial history. If I went country by country, you would probably mostly be saying Britain, France, Britain, France, Every so often you'd say Belgium, every so often you'd say Germany, okay? Little bit in, in Portugal, although there aren't big, big uh, collections there. And so really we come down to a second factor of being the specimens, the historical records are held in colonial country institutions and have not always been, in fact have frequently not been, mobilized as digital, as accessible, and integrated into the broader whole such that they would be digital accessible knowledge. And then the third set of factors is for birds, not a huge, Ben is an ex exception to this, but not a huge community of bird watchers and observational data collectors across the continent, okay? So that's, that's just reality. And part of this project is, can we, by pointing out the gaps, can we promote filling some of these gaps? But this is birds. This is the best known group. There's a close up of Africa. I should have gone to that a, min a moment ago. You can see in Ethiopia, there's just this you know, kind of the highway we've, we've driven in the last couple of days, and you go a little farther east and a little farther west or north, nothing. Okay, there are records, but they don't make complete inventories. So there's a, there's a, a different view of bird records across Africa. Those are simply numbers of records, not the completeness of inventories. And I put this up just so you could see a little bit in finer detail the distribution of these records, okay? And you can see some big dark areas, okay? And that's where bird watchers aren't going. But here's the really sad thing. Let's look at another group that might be an important focus of conservation efforts. Nymphalid butterflies. Uh-oh, look at Ethiopia. I see about 10 points in there. Let's look at Staphylinid beetles, which we would love to include in our planning for conservation. And look at Staphylinid beetles. I don't think I see more than one or two dots in the northern half of Africa. So my point is, that our digital accessible knowledge gets really sparse really quickly when we get away from a few groups such as butterflies, 
a few really charismatic insects, some groups of plants, and then it tapers off really quickly. Okay? So do we want to build a conservation prioritization based on information like this? No. There simply isn't enough information yet. So we end up thinking about these species that can essentially serve as a proxy for other, for other taxa. And a whole bunch of different terms have been used. I'm not going to pick apart the definitions. Um, an umbrella species, you might think of something like the panda example that I showed earlier. If you protect pandas, they require this whole ecosystem and a whole bunch of other neat species go along with that. An indicator species is a species or a taxon that if you see it, you know all that other stuff is there. Good example might be Nothophagus forests, which are indicators of the Gondwanan Southern Hemisphere temperate forests. And then a, a very interesting set of, of tax are what could be called keystone species. And these are species that are guessed to be or known to be crucial to the actual functioning of a community, an ecosystem, a biome. Okay? But this is just species that might be particularly relevant or particularly um, crucial to be considering in this in this um, this kind of forced use of surrogates in conservation work. So ideally what we would do, we could use well-known and well-documented taxa to understand patterns and identify priorities. Right? Lee just showed you a bunch of examples with plants, which in South Africa are very well documented. Um, I've just shown you some maps of birds. So ideally, we could use those relatively well-known taxa to pick out a strategy. And those patterns and priorities, ideally, would then suffice to protect all of biodiversity, the nymphalid butterflies, the staphylinid beetles, the frogs, the small mammals. Okay, that's the ideal world. But whether we can do this depends on the degree to which the well-known taxon represents the patterns and the priorities and the details in the poorly known taxon. So that's the question. So I want to point out two problems. One problem is just that different taxa show different patterns. Okay? So let's look at an example. A really nice paper called Who's Where in North America? And what they've done is they took the terrestrial re ecoregions of North America, and so each of these polygons with a different color is a different ecoregion. They took birds, mammals, butterflies, amphibians, reptiles, land snails, tiger beetles, vascular plants, and trees. And you can see the richness of these groups goes from about 100 to more than 20,000. Okay? And for each group and for each ecoregion, here are the ecoregions, and here's amphibians, birds, butterflies, da, 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 they got a richness value. So that's simply the number of species that occurs in that ecoregion. And they also combined this into an overall index of rich richness of that ecoregion. I'm not going to go into the details of, of how they did that. I'll get you guys the paper. And so here's that overall richness index. So this is looking at patterns across all of the taxa. Okay? And what do we see? Well, northern Canada is pretty depauperate. Northern U.S. is still pretty depauperate. And then the southeast and parts of the southwest of the country and this Gulf fringe tend to be the richest part. But that is an overall richness pattern 
taking into account the variation in each of those many taxonomic groups. You can see, you know, the lat latitudinal species gradient as you go north of the southernmost point in the, in the region that they were uh, considering. You see, for every single group, the richness goes down as you go north. Okay? So with butterflies, it goes down faster. With beetles, it goes down slower. But that's the general pattern. So now we get to the interesting thing. Let's look at one taxon, butterflies, against this overall richness index. And you can see there's a nice linear relationship, right? So in that sense, if this were our well-known taxa, taxon, sorry, we could say, well, we can predict the overall richness index, we can predict the patterns for all these other taxa, and we're done. But I want you to notice some things. Look at this, this general value of about 180 species of butterflies. Go up, and in our overall richness index, we have this place, which hits at about 0.14, and this place that hits at about, uh-oh, 